So if I, if I get to go first, then yeah. I'm gonna pick the nice one that's nice <laughs> and juicy. Um, the AI for me is, is probably the best enabler, but can also be a derailer. So you run the risk of relying on AI technology that's not necessarily mature. And then on the flip side, while you're trying to protect, detect um, cyber attacks, the people that are attacking you in the same way will be able to use AI against you. Um, and then in itself creates an, an interesting paradigm. So I think that's a space to watch. Um, I'm really concerned because we're trying to protect an entire area, whereas an attacker is just looking for that one hole. Mm -hmm. And I think the AI will really enable them in, in, a, in a negative way. Do you think AIs, so just before we go on to a but do you think at the moment the defenders, when it comes to AI, have a bit of an advantage? There's loads of cybersecurity companies specializing in this people working and maybe it hasn't proliferated to the ne'er-do-wells of the world yet? So I think in short, I think there's a lot of good technology out there, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's progressing. It's, it's, not, it's not at a level yet where I think one can, can say it's, it's, it's solving our problems. Mm. Um, it's a challenger, so to speak, and, and I think it's improving every day. I mean, I was reading an article around the number of tech startups, um, specifically around AI and the companies that are investing in it. Um, specifically from a cybersecurity perspective. So there's no doubt about it, it is the future. Um, but right now, I think um, the technology itself is not necessarily that mature. Um, but the risk is when it does, it will also count against us. I pick the other end of the spectrum. <clears throat> if you look at all the breaches, around 20% could have been prevented by technology. 80% mm. was back to, we heard before, fitting the task to the human. So everything that helps at the moment to see cybersecurity as a topic for the whole organization, including supervisory reports down to the people, will help us to make a step forward. So um, from that perspective, resilience would be the, the, the name of the game, so to speak, uh, because many people talk about it, many people have maybe business continuity plans in their drawers or incident response plans or disaster recovery. But, I mean, that's not a problem for this room, but maybe outside of this room, when have you last time practiced a disaster recovery? When have you looked at your business continuity plans? So everything that helps you to understand the, the issue gets transparency into the, the topic, monitors in a way that the board is aware of it, you know, not on the technological stuff um, with uh, hundreds of KPIs, but rather giving a management view on the issue would vastly, would say, improve the situation. And what about you? I think I'd hate to say that any one of them is going to be a silver bullet. I mean, it always depends on whether they're being created with defense in mind. What I do think is an interesting development is something like the cloud, so the move away from paper based. Uh, uh, kind of systems to uh, paperless systems. In a previous life, I worked for a data privacy organization, and it was amazing how many times filing cabinets of information were lost, files were left on buses, etc. Now, I'm not saying that going paperless is the silver bullet in any way. That obviously causes problems within itself, many of which we've heard about today. But having more accountability, more of an audit trail, more transparency in terms of the end user as the individual in terms of how your data is being collected and where it's being stored. I think will ultimately, when it comes to cybersecurity, just bring far more dividends to the individual. Yeah, hi. Um, our organization, Leonardo, we look after some very big organizations like uh, NATO, parts of the Ministry of Defense and so on. So um, for us, we are concerned for insider threat um, we're concerned about uh, state actors and so on. So when we look at AI and machine learning, well, AI's been around for quite some time, and it has a bright future. The current vibe is machine learning, and they're all, for the time being, about analytics. Um, for us, there are, there are two areas of great interest um, in that space. Um, the first is non-obvious relationship analysis. So um, the kind of things that our brightest analysts sit and ponder over, have meetings about, and then come up with their, their results. Um, the ability to be able to do that in volume overnight to allow these guys to get asleep would be a great thing. Um, very closely connected to that, indeed, 
retaining our best analysts is always a big issue because they don't, they're very bright people, very well educated. Um, I mean, and uh, they really don't want to spend their time in, in the dead of night doing sort of boring stuff. Um, and it seems to us that, in, uh, that, that there is a place for, for AI or machine learning uh, in that space now. Well, we don't make that stuff ourselves. We have to rely on the, the, products, the products industry uh, to come up with that kind of thing for us. Um, you asked us what, our, what might be our greatest fear in this space, I think. Um, and I suppose I would say it would be, if you take machine learning um, and AI, if you imagine that as a service on the cloud that our adversaries could buy as well. So um, their ability to analyze in, in much greater depth their targets or a market that they intend to attack uh, will give us a greater problem. But of course, as a cyber security service, that's all good news because it keeps us in business for many years. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's what I want to um, Yeah, it's a good point how a lot of the uh, threats seem to come from cybersecurity. There's a vested interest there, isn't there? Of course. In um, doing that. Um, Paul, elevated heartbeat, if you just run into the room, we're just asking uh, what tech are you most excited about in terms of adapting it for cybersecurity, uh, and what are you most worried about as well? Um, that's a good, I think Jeremy's a, the one person on the panel I've, I've run into on a number of occasions, so my history is so. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, sorry to run in like this. Um, what am I most interested? I think um, I think the big big one is for me is is the, in the change in the network space. I'm slightly biased on BT. That would be an easy one to that. Um, but the, the world has gone away from uh, the ability to kind of fixed circuits the way we, we used to do jobs. But um, and it, and the move into software defined network space, dynamic network services, those kind of things, gives us an opportunity to respond in a new way. Um, and the days have gone that it's just a provider of, I, I can do a communication from A to B. I can now mitigate, I can now change uh, um, my posture depending on the threat. Um, uh, DDoS is a classic example of that, uh, where before it was about huge volumes of data going along a, a tunnel towards a, a, an endpoint or a, a location. And um, what you'd have to do is actually mitigate it mid-route. And then the, the attacker would know you're doing it. They could see a difference. Well, actually, now we can redirect valid traffic using software-defined networks to move it in a different part, uh, different direction. And actually, the attacker thinks they're being successful, which means they're, they're happy, they move on, they go on to the next attack, and yet there's actually no effect to the business. Um, and I think that flows all the way through that, through that ability. So you can, you can respond in new ways. You have joined up services, so uh, you're able to respond in a nice, rapid way. But also that service provision is there. It enables the business. What am I most scared of? Um, I think the bits I'm, I'm most scared of is the pace of change um, and trying to stay with that. Um, the attackers can move at, a, at a, an amazing rate uh, and trying to stay with that is always going to be our challenge. Um, uh, the reason I'm late today is that we're at the uh, uh, UK-Israeli uh, Tech Hub event with uh, uh, 13 brand new SMEs. Um, and it, it's trying to keep that pulse always making sure that you're, you're ahead of the next bit. Um, I, um, I don't know about the, the, the rest of the panel, but my remit goes around from everybody here who's a consumer uh, all the way through to global business. I've got to care about every single thing that fits into that pattern. Um, and that means a vast amount of technology and vast amount of change. Uh, so my, what keeps me up at night is what's changed overnight. I mean, I, mean, I suppose that's the next question, range of, sort of businesses here. Uh, when you see these cutting-edge technologies and you say, oh, I like that, how easy is it to get it working, to get it out there on the front line? Um, whoever wants to jump in. May I go first here? Uh, we are also advising the leading cybersecurity companies on the planet. And they have exactly this problem. So if I talk to the, uh, the colleagues in the US, in continental Europe, in Russia, wherever they are, they uh, already describing a scenario you were referring to, AI is fighting AI. And there's no doubt about that, that this is the long-term vision. So basically shutting out the, the human part of the equation. And if you look at the reality today, and if you look at WannaCry, it was referred several times today, WannaCry was an unsophisticated attack against a legacy operating system. And you see what effect it had. 
And that shows that just the applicability of this technology is a huge issue. If you look at how it comes out of the box, usually it would do the job. But if you are a CIO, sorry, colleagues, uh, of course you want to show your added value, you want to configure, you want to switch on some um, parameters. And as a result, just recently <laughs> discussed, you switch on parameters very few people on this planet do. And then you realize your cybersecurity technology has a flaw exactly in this parameter and you make everything worse, just as an example. And it happened uh, in reality the large breaches. So um, this training and getting aware and to come back to this, this task, fitting the task to the human is currently really unsolved. And I do hope that AI or whatever you want to call it, deep machine learning and so on, uh, will make it easier. But at the end of the day, if you're a large corporation, you have 10,000 people or more who have to maintain their smartphones, their notebooks, link want to link everywhere on this planet into their corporate network, don't want to bother with any multi-factor authentication whatsoever. So to really overcome this natural resistance is actually unsolved, I would say. But maybe I'm, I'm wrong and you tell me differently. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, challenges, I think you're saying, of, of implementing these new technologies for, for an organization. Um, so we constantly have to do that kind of thing. I wouldn't say we've had to implement artificial intelligence yet. Uh, we have used machine learning and so on for some customers on our, the Italian side of our business. Um, the challenges, I'm glad to say, and I'm, I bet a lot of people in this room will be, will be uh, relieved to know, are the, are the same old challenges. Uh, we're not, we don't all have to learn to be experts in artificial intelligence because for a big organization to take on uh, that kind of new technology to defend itself or to, to buy services that can do that, it has the same problems of, of uh, legacy systems and legacy processes. So when a new organization takes on brand new technology, it's still got the old stuff and they have to work together and the people have to work across both. You still have system administrators, the great weak spot in any big organization. They're, they're really good guys, guys and girls, um, and usually very well vetted, but they can, they can break through any kind of uh, security that you, you care to mention. Um, users, um, and uh, I know the Information Commission, I think it was, 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 was saying we shouldn't really look down on the users, but, but we're all users and we, we evolve new ways of being stupid every day, really, um, and we'll continue to do so. So uh, what, when we implement these new technologies, we've got to deal with uh, all of those issues too. So uh, that's, what I think the few, that's what I think that will look like for us. If you take a slightly different tack on things and you, you take a step back and you say, so every day there's new technology, some of it's good, some of it's bad, and, and do we need to implement the latest tech? So if you take a really simple type of service, so uh, managed detection and response, which is the evolution of SimSoc as a service, so to speak. So there you would have your simple correlation rules, and a simple example would be uh, I'm sitting here um, I'm VPNing into my office and somebody has my access card and is in swiping at my office to get in. Um, the inverse would obviously be I would be in my office and somebody's VPNing in from Russia. Now that's a simple correlation rule, simple in AI. Um, and then if you say, well, if I've got something really sophisticated that, that has its own mind and can learn by itself, what is it learning to do? And what do we want it to learn to do? Mm. So. If I go talk to customers, I say, listen, you need to buy the BDO managed detection and response service. They look at me and they say, how is it any different to what I've currently got? And a show of hands in the audience, how many of you have some sort of monitoring solution in your organization? Okay, so all of you want the fancy AI stuff. How many of you have deception technology, honeypots, implemented with your SimSoc? And now that technology is really cost effective and it's been around for a long time. And here we are talking about uh, fancy next generation things, but we're not even getting the stuff that was there two or three years ago. So for me, if I have to say, you know, the challenge of getting it in, it's actually just get the challenge of getting what was created a year or two ago, which is actually really effective. Because if you look at deception technology and the fact that everyone's trying to detect early that breach, 
the deception technology is probably a, a key differentiator in you being able to do that. Um, because even if you have the AI, the ability to detect something, there has to be something that's, that's listening out there. Um, and deception technology is something that's, that's really easily implementable and cost effective and will provide that early detection. And that for me is, I'm almost saying, you've got to have that before you can even start considering the next generation AI type technology. If we're accepting you're always going to have a breach, part of that will be responding to that. Um, so it would be good to talk about that, um, both technologically, but also reputation as well. So Emma, I want to talk to you about this. Um, what, I mean, we've seen some really high profile breaches handled well or not well, we could argue about yeah. it. Um, how important is the public response to a breach? And how should companies be handling it? Um, depending on the, let, let's say it's a really big thing, yeah. like a talk talk or an Equifax. Um, how do you handle that to minimize the damage to the company? Well, the first thing that in an ideal world you'd be doing is thinking about this proactively. So you'd have your ducks in a row before any kind of serious data breach occurs to know, you know the, from top to the bottom, if something happens, what are you going to say? How are you going to talk about it? Who do you need to talk to? Having all of that regularly updated in one place, that's reviewed. So if and when something does happen, people can act fast and can act smart. Um, we do a lot of kind of uh, simulations in this space and when you're in the heat of the moment, if something's happened, you've got a bunch of people, whether it's lawyers, public relations experts, your engineers, giving you conflicting information about how you respond and how you communicate a data breach to your customers. As a CEO, or as the kind of the main decision maker in that organization, who do you listen to? You don't want to be making those decisions right then and there. That's in an ideal world. In a not so ideal world, when uh, a data breach has occurred, you want to be communicating relatively quickly, um, relatively effectively when it comes to what has actually happened. But you want to be managing the situation. You don't want it to let it run away from you. So we've seen recently con uh, customers becoming aware that something's happened before the organization itself. And that spreads so quickly now because of social media. Um, social media teams not necessarily being joined up to the main um, PR teams within uh, an organization. So there's conflicting information going out. And consumers get very mad very, very quickly, and word spreads. And then people like Tom pick up the news and then become, an, <laughs> become an irritant as well. No offense. Too much of But then Elizabeth Denham picks up the news, and then Kieran Martin at the NCSC picks up the news. And so you're getting lots and lots of requests for information, and you might still not understand what has happened because the super smart people who are in your organization are uh, beavering away trying to work it out for themselves. They're then explaining it to you and your member of the board. And if you've not been talking about this particularly regularly, you can't translate what they're telling you into something that you can easily put out for your cons uh, customers and consumers to understand. So having these uh, conversations regularly, um, making sure they're translated into simple language, and having that in your top drawer so if something happens, you can act super quickly because reputation can go away from you so, so quickly. Um, City AM put out a really interesting graph, actually, when it came to share price with TalkTalk Talk after, um, uh, after that uh, high-profile breach. And it correlated it against much, much larger breaches, um, like Target, um, Coffin Warehouse, etc. And TalkTalk Talk share price was much more adversely affected because of how they communicated it. And they went for worst case scenario in terms of the number of customers that were affected from day one. Now, that's one way, that's one strategy of doing things. Um, we could have a whole conference about whether that was the right or wrong thing to do. But it just shows you it's not just about your consumer's reputation, it's about your financial reputation as well. Uh, and I think when you have the, uh, you know, when you have to report things under GDPR, that's going to change, the, especially the media side of things, a lot more, how you respond to it on the first. So are you about to. No, I was just going to say, I, I, I totally agree with that statement. I, I also would add, um, I think you need to be careful who you're communicating to. And I think uh, Talk Talk's a rather good example of how to completely mess it yourself up. apart. Uh, you then start seeing those silly things that perhaps were general hygiene, that, that was, well, going back to the other, other conversation, is just the human factor, is just what we're naturally doing. Is it quite hard for companies from the sort of outside, from the journalist perspective, when, when, I mean, when Sony got hacked and they said it's North Korea, I was like, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm sure <laughs> North Korea hacked you. Uh, and then North Korea had hacked them. Um, and then you get things like, you know, TV5, uh, the French TV station, which was hacked by Islamic State, um, actually turned out to be Russia. 
um, who took them off air, which is quite impressive. Uh, and then you have things like TalkTalk, which is a MySQL injection, right? Um, how hard is it for companies to realize what's happened and how much do they want to hide behind the nation state or say this is a very sophisticated thing, not a 20-year-old fraud in the system? And could you see why they want to exploit that and why, what should they do? So I think the, if, if, you're, if you're not doing your simulation training and, and you're not able to communicate effectively, then you kind of, you know, what do you say? You can't get up and say, I don't know anything. Um, so you've, you've kind of got to reach for something that's, you know, deniable plausibility, you know, it's, it's kind of that perspective. I think the real challenge is, is when it comes down to investigating and trying to identify where the breach came from and, and what happened. Most organizations actually, they don't know where to start. So, um, you know, you've got two types of simulation training. You've got with board and exco and, and middle management. Um, and then you've got the IT component, which is the red team, blue team type scenarios, good, good guys and bad guys. Um, there's generally a middle ground where there's that end-to-end -end simulation, which sometimes doesn't happen. So one of the breaches that I was involved in was a financial services organization. Um, in four hours, they lost 30 million euros that, that just went off the, the bottom line uh, on the balance sheet. So it wasn't customer accounts that got um, affected. It was actually just the balance sheet. Um, so it's a lot quite an, in, um, quite an involved hack in how it happened. But the bottom line was when the breach took place, business were carrying on running around trying to brief um, the media. IT were running around going, listen, what happened? The fraud controls should have kicked in. This is a, this is a credit card issue. And, you know, end to end, no one was talking to one another. So, the, so the, the management was saying to the media one thing. IT was leaking other stories via other sources. Um, and the two never lined up. And when it actually came, came out what actually had happened, um, they found basic things were, were deficient. Core trees. So when Visa MasterCard identified the issue, they started phoning <coughs> the organization. The first seven numbers on the call tree of 10 um, were either not valid um, or went straight to voicemail, and they were supposed to be 24-hour numbers. Um, when they eventually did get through to somebody, that person had been moved department. Um, they didn't know who to phone. So you know these things kind of carried on. So they responded slowly. They weren't coordinated. They didn't communicate a consistent message. And when it came down to the post-mortem of everything, um, they realized that there was no golden thread that ran through the entire organization end-to-end, -end, tying it all together. And that's where the real challenge is. It's, it's not only a business or an IT problem. It's an end-to-end. Um, and making sure that everyone's messaging the same and running that consistent process is critical. So the be best technology might just be a Slack channel so everyone can chat in the same room. Cool. We've got that. That's fine. That's all fixed. Um, so I drifted away from the future there. That's my fault. Um, yeah. Does anyone have any questions um, for the panel? It's got to be one. There's one. Thank you. Uh, can we get a microphone over here? Sorry. Just down. Ranu Pereira from Regulation and Risk Limited. Um, there's the information commissioner's office, which regulates the, the cybersecurity. But a lot of the organizations that, um, which hold uh, sensitive data, financial data, on their customers are banks, investment firms, and insurance companies. They are regulated by the Prudential Regulation Authority, the PRA, and the Financial Conduct Authority. Um, how does the panel feel uh, that these three regulatory bodies looking more or less at this um, amongst, there is some overlap between their roles and how is this working out and how could it work out better? You want to say that one? I think it, in all of these cases, it, it could always work better. I think, that, I mean, the Information Commissioner's office is the primary responsibility in this area, you're absolutely right. But you also, as separate companies, will have um, obligations to other regulators. Data is um, important across all sectors and industries now. And it's up to individual regulators to be up to speed on what GDPR means for their sector and how they can be working with the ICO. I know the ICO is um, very open to engagement, not just with individual businesses, but with regulators as a whole. Now, what we need to ensure is that 
again, if a data breach occurs, that you're not getting conflicting information when it comes to reporting. Um, and I've had a number of questions about, well, we've got mandatory reporting when it comes to GDPR to the ICO, but do I need to let, for instance, the FCA know as well? Um, my, my reaction to that would be yes, I would send the, uh, the email to the ICO and copy it in the FCA, if, then you're covered. But I don't think, as far as I'm aware, there's been official guidance on that uh, to date. I, I could well be wrong. Um, but it's up to business to be pushing for that. Everybody has got a huge amount on their plate when it comes to different policies and regulations that are um, coming into force um, shortly. So if you are concerned about a lack of joined up thinking when it comes to the regulators that you are bound to in your sectors, make that be known. Maybe um, to add a perspective, I love UK, so I want to be able to come back after this conference, so I have to carefully choose my, my <laughs> words. Um, we are working, obviously, for large corporations, helping them to implement regulations. And there are um, 100 new regulations per day on this planet for banking alone. 100 regulations per day. So I would say there's room for improvement, indeed. <laughs> um, otherwise, I mean, consultancy also have a a job for the next uh, decades, I would say. Uh, kidding aside, um, the problem is that somewhere a topic is elevated and many people jump on that topic. And be it regulations, be it law firms, uh, um, legislation, and so on. And everybody, of course, wants to show the value at different aspect to the same problem, and I'm fully with you. Um, and sometimes you have simply contradicting messaging in a simple regulation like GDPR. I mean, if you're in the boardroom and telling a large corporation, here, that is what is, you are asked for, at least two board members will say, maybe from business, uh, yes, I understand that, Walter, but you know that there's a different legislation that tells me exactly the opposite. I can't do that. So I'm not a lawyer. I'm an engineer. Uh, so I say, okay, good. We have to sort it out. One fact. Uh, the second one is, and this is, I think, also a mistake from corporations. They seek the, the, the conversation, the dialogue with regulators much too late. Mm -hmm. You have a regulation out there. You know it for years, literally. You know now May 18 is coming. And you start to invite experts or you talk in boards in October 17 or September. That's maybe not this, the smartest idea, I would say. And you are you know, talking about technology, but have completely forgotten that there's a dialogue possibility to regulators. And you can talk, obviously, to the regulators and understand better what is really you ask for. And that would make, you know, if, if you just establish this dialogue, I would say 70% of the friction would be evaporated. I'd have to echo that, that statement, and um, I, I think there's a mixture there of um, we have, you have to do that with the people who set the bar, so the governments of the world, NCSC in our world here. Um, you have to have those early engagements of, uh, of, of putting that reality around what is, what is out there in the big wide world and, and what controls you can use. But yeah, we've got a global problem. There's, GDPR has, has kind of expanded that. Um, but remember, we've got, to, we've got to deal with the same conversation for um, our, our suppliers as much as anything else. Some of those small companies that are providing the little plastic clip on your, uh, uh, your, your home internet connection or the, or the little widget that sits <coughs> in the back of your, your TV today, actually, they've got to be protected by this. And so I, I think the thing that's changed, and, and it goes into the, each individual regulator, but also pushes down the chain, is... We've got to break the barriers now, especially in cyber, between the, the provider and supplier kind of relationships or customer su supplier relationship um, to make sure it is an ongoing one. And it's exactly the same one in, into, the, uh, into any, any regulatory authority. You've got to have those conversations. So, because we're all talking different languages if we're not careful. If I say one thing in, in, in technology space, business speak could mean so the same, exactly the same conversation. So you have to iron those out. And it means when you do have that breach, you're instantly through a layer of that conversation uh, and you're able to go to the ICO or the FS, whichever option you want to go. Look, you know that thing I talked about last week? Yeah, I think we've, I think we've been hit by it. We've, we've put the, you know the controls are in place. What is your guidance? And it becomes, instead of a, a notification, it becomes a conversation that ends in a notification. So they already know what's going on, but they, they already know what their response is going to be. 
And I think that's pretty general across our, our, our environment today. And I think it's a bit of a paradigm shift. I think to your point, I think the guidance needs to come out much earlier. And, and where there's, there's gray area and contradiction of note, there needs to be proper guidance and, and not what you end up with a bit of uncertainty. Um, because that's where I think many people sit is they, they find themselves stuck between two different pieces of, of legislation or guidance and it's, it's gray area and then they have, they have to go to the lawyers and you know, more job creation, which is good, but it'd be nice to, 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 to have clear guidance and, and, and for business to be able to obtain certainty around that. Because that's for me, is where the last opportunity is. I mean, it sounds like, I mean, speaking of trends and technologies, actually the, the biggest thing for all of you is GDPR and regulations coming. That's the thing that's occupying most of your headspace rather than what you know, hackers in a bedroom might be doing or hackers in Russia. Is that a fair to say? Not, not necessarily. Yeah. Um, I, I just because I think it probably is in common across a number of the people on the panel. Um, just for contrast, I would say, because um, of the space we tend to work in, um, it's how to keep doing business and interoperate. Um, and I don't necessarily mean the GDPR. I mean, um, in the space we're in, we're, kind of, we're more concerned with changes to, to what security creditors say. Or, um, so there are, what they call in the military, the JSP 440 or the strap manual from other parts of, of, of government and so on. And how do you continue to interoperate with your partners within your own organization and indeed uh, overseas? Uh, with some incredibly tight regulations on what you can do. And, and these give rise to um, very interesting new ways of, of doing technology uh, and challenges for engineers. So that's just an interesting sort of a, another side to the debate, really. Um, I, I think uh, um, uh, from, from, from my side of the house, uh, I am more worried about the, the hacker. I'm, not, I'm less worried about the, the uh, um, uh, regulations or the change in... That is a problem. I'll do add that one in. Um, mainly because, uh, as, as a CNI provider, um, BT are very aggressive with the way we, we put our security. We have been a security by default for a number of years. Um, every person's home internet has a protection layer on it. Uh, our data is, is religious to us. And it, it's an inbuilt thing. And I suspect there's a, there's a tie over for that doing the right thing from being a civil service organization. I think that's still part of our kind of our core ethos. So we're l almost less worried about that hygiene. We keep up the pressure and we think it's important, but we want to be in the next space because we're opening up new boundaries. So it's our worry about the, the hacker is about enablement for the business. Um, uh, BT Sport is a classic example. It's a whole new different direction from us. Um, the amount of work that we had to change that dynamic. I know you're Sky. <laughs> Competition's good. That's good. Yeah, I'm glad you said More that. More money for footballers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Couldn't That's agree good. with that. <laughs> I think we prefer rugby, just okay. to say. Yeah. Uh, real men and all that, I think, this conversation. Uh, uh, <laughs> how many people have I alienated for that statement? At least two. At least two. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> good, that's always a good start. I do like football too, but I'm a Leeds fan, so I'm not sure that counts. Ooh, yeah. um, uh, but, uh, but that... I think that the danger is because we're going to that new space, it's always looking at that risk against us and how do we respond and how do we protect not just that critical national infrastructure that we take personally, but then how does that lie on to each of our customers? I've been talking about that CNI stuff and the risk. Um, if you read the media, um, sorry about this, uh, or if you watch a film, the great film Die Hard, Die Harder, or is it Die Hard 5, where they hack into the city, they take control of the traffic lights and the car hits a helicopter and it's great. Uh, and that sort of internet of things hacking, we hear a lot about it in the media. Is that something you're really worried about, like industrial control systems, yeah. or is that just so small a risk that so it gets overhyped? Industrial control systems, for me, is, is, is probably the, the next kind of big thing. Um, I think it's, it's largely neglected. Um, if, if you look at, the, at where industrial control systems lie, um, it, it's vast. You, you don't actually realize it. So, so I wouldn't be too, I mean, I'm concerned about my personal details being breached, but I'm, I'm probably more concerned about somebody gaining control of a nuclear power station. And everyone's going to think, well, they'll just blow it up and it would be bad. But what about if they just increased the output and overloaded the grid? Um, that would be of more concern um, or change the routing of the grid to overload it in many respects. So you could end up with a scenario where you have a nationwide blackout 
um, which could last a number of days, if not weeks. And that, for me, would be of greater concern because, um, you know, if you can imagine the whole of London with, with, with our power, what would, what would happen? Um, you know, people would be stranded. Um, if you look at water systems, at flushing of toilets, so you take that for granted. How does water arrive? It gets pumped. <coughs> How does sewage disappear? It gets pumped out. If those pumps are unable to work, what happens? So seven or eight million people living in a city unable to flush a toilet or access to drinking water creates a, a real problem. Um, if you look at when the, the US went into Baghdad, first thing they did was they killed the water systems. And they believed that by doing that, it reduced the time of the war um, by three or four days to their advantage in terms of shortening it. So industrial control systems lie everywhere. Um, and if you take your basic hive system that sits in your house, um, if that's not adequately secured and I arrive home and I've got no hot water and I'm unable to fix that, I'm probably as scared as, of my wife as the hacker. So, you know, it has the ability to, to really disrupt our lives in a, in a, in a terrible, terrible way. Smart metering is, a, is another one. Um, the first round of smart meters that went out were, were quite vulnerable. Um, the SMEG2, which is, which is now, is, is more secure. But <coughs> once again, if, if it's compromised, you have the ability to switch off everyone's power who has a smart meter. Uh, and, and that, for me, is, is an area that's neglected. So when I say neglected, it's not like no one's doing anything about it. Quite the contrary, there are. Um, but to what extent? So when these products are released and they go into the market, is security a bolt-on? Or is it by design? Um, and, and I think that's, that's an interesting point. So I'm not saying it's terrible out there. I'm not creating fear and uncertainty. But um, I recently put an alarm in my house that's got cameras all over the place. And it, I can control it from my phone. And I thought, oh, that's quite great and everything. And then my wife, wife said to me, but it's got a camera. Can the control room see the camera? It can see us and just look at it? And I kind of thought, well, I didn't really do much thought process around it. But I'm hoping they've got better things to do than look at me making coffee in the morning. Um, but it, if you think about it, it actually is a real concern. Now, I should have probably asked them, do they have some sort of assurance, an ISO audit, a SOC 2 type report or anything? And I didn't. Maybe as consumers, we should be asking these questions and driving that behavior change. To adding to Jason's point, which I fully, uh, fully subscribe, I mean, uh, we all have to be aware that the Pandora's box is open. We have six to 10 billion, depending on the source, of IoT devices out there. And who have heard about Mirai? Mirai, Popnet, anything? Mirai? Um, and you know, Mirai is nothing else than a, a malware. The problem is uh, it detects exactly this kind of IoT devices, which has by default uh, the username admin and the password 000, whatever. And the source code is completely open on the internet. Everybody can alter it and can use it. And they brought down a country, a full country was down. Uh, they brought down Amazons and PayPals of this like. I mean, not small companies, certainly not with uh, backup systems. And ISPs are more or less helpful, helpless um, to, to, um, to convince or to, to counteract it. And that's the problem. Some of them. Some of them. Of course, BD is a great ex uh, exception. I, I'm, I definitely. Notice that. that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You should have a disclaimer. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Exactly. So we'll just assume that. We'll I'm just always talking about people outside this room, yeah. obviously. <laughs> um, and the problem is there. The, the, the point of the greatest vulnerability, the IoT device, is not the point of the greatest harm. It's, there's a victim chain. It, the problem is here. The, the harm is there. So how to cooperate? How to make it... Uh, better and this is an unsolved problem and it cannot be solved by order by regulation or legislation it cannot be solved that somebody says okay i take care of the problem it needs collaboration along the whole victim chain and this is extremely tough not just from a, a mental perspective also from the economics because it's a hyper competitive market out there you know the, the cameras as you just mentioned have hundreds of of uh, suppliers and, and every harm or every sophistication you ask from the consumer, like changing a password or whatever, is a competitive disadvantage, believe it or not. And is additional cost element, even if it's in the sense, it makes a difference. So this is, from my perspective, a, a problem we will face severely over the next years and it's not easily solved in months. I don't know if you remember 
a few years ago, um, the ICO put out a warning because they'd found a Russian website was live streaming webcams. And these were webcams in offices, in people's living rooms, in nurseries, um, in gym changing rooms. And there was, a, there was a huge amount of coverage of that because it was shocking to people that something um, as innocuous as a um, kind of IoT gadget could be hacked into like that and was being live streamed for the world to see. Now, I think there's joint responsibility here. And this is where privacy by design um, is so important. Companies have, I think, an obligation that if you produce a product like that, you make it very clear when you sell it to a, a consumer that there is a camera and it needs to be password protected. And you make it easier for your average consumer to be able to do that. If you are a consumer and you are bringing something that is an internet connected device into your home, then you should be aware of what that means and the fact that you have to add your added security onto that. Or you are open to vulnerabilities like anyone watching that via that Russian website. You can't bring something like that into your home and then act surprised when there's a vulnerability. There has to be joint responsibility. And I see this is kind of comes back to the kind of the, the cybersecurity data breach. Um, consumers acting shocked when a cyber attack has happened because that's the first time they've ever had any form of communication with their provider or with a company about security. Now, when I try and advise um, proactively uh, with businesses, you should be having that conversation with your custom, customer base consistently, talking about their obligations as well as yours to keep them safe, about passwords, um, about public Wi-Fi, um, using public computers, that sort of thing. The first time that a consumer and a business has an interaction around cybersecurity should not be when something has gone wrong or when the consumer themselves feel like the contract between themselves and the business has been violated. Great. I mean, I remember that ICO thing, um, finding one webcam in Hounslow. Uh, we went and knocked on their door, and they were very surprised to see us there showing them their kid upstairs in yep. their car. Um, thank you so much to the panel. Um, really, really interesting. Walter, Jeremy, Emma, Jason, and Paul, uh, thanks very much thank indeed. You very much.